couldn't have come to see this guy, right? Uh, to my right is Andy Beyer. If you're not familiar with Andy Beyer, you're not following this thing. Thank you. I don't know if you guys know this. Andy Beyer actually retired. You retired this year? I did. Uh, you know, I, I've been writing for 40 plus years and you know, busy enough for the, my figure business that I, at, at the age of 72. I didn't need two years. So pretty much all you do is go to Florida for a couple months to ride your bike in the winter and to Saratoga to ride your bike in the summer. Right. I mean, those are, you know, I, you know, I play mostly during the winter, uh, you know, for Gulf Street in Tampa Bay. That's my. Uh, that's my main gambling focus. I tried to get geared up this year for a full-scale assault at Saratoga, like in the old days. It's so exhausting to handicap the cards here, you know, with the huge fields, turf races, and so on. Uh, uh, I, you know, I lasted about two days. It, it, it wasn't like the old days when, uh, uh, you know, when I had the energy to you know, spend a full day here, go to Saratoga, harness at night, and then on the off day, drive up a paddle for Vermont for 14 uh, dog races. <laughs> Those were great times. I don't know how we did it. I guess part of the reason we were able to do is there were only nine races a day, right? <laughs> well, when you added in all the extras in, I mean, that could be tough. Well, well, the other thing was, it, it was harder back then because we couldn't get the PPs until so late. So, I mean, I, I go back to, and I don't know if any people remember here, waiting for the Bradley Racing Farm at Joe Duels on Broadway, and that's where I met you. <laughs> It was one of the great scenes that really epitomized what Saratoga is about because the racing forum, for those who don't remember, would come in maybe like 10.30 at night for the next day. There was no advanced edition. And so a crowd would gather outside Joe Duell's newsstand at Broadway and Fire Street and they were just pacing like you know, nervous cats waiting, waiting to see the truck with the forms. And, uh, and, and of course, everybody was chatting and, re and re you know, recapping the day's uh, activities at the track. And amazingly, amidst all of these uh, hardcore horse players, there was this little kid who was about 12 years old who would loudly pontificate about everything that was going on in the whole world of racing. That was the beginning of Little Andy and my friendship. <laughs> Very true. I actually have my, my copy of Picking Winners signed by Andy from July 29th, 1975. It's one of my most cherished, uh, cherished possessions, actually. So, moving ahead now to 2016, 41 years later, and we're exactly the same age now. Um, that's what happens as you get older. All your friends are older than you become the same age. Let's talk a little bit about racing and how racing has changed. What do you think? From a horse player's perspective, what are the biggest changes in the game since back in those days? You know, from uh, I mean, you can you can certainly talk about exotic betting and and you know, you know a, a lot of the uh, you know the, you know, the innovations and, and, you know, and, and exotic bets that kind of change the way we play. But to me, the, as a player, the biggest change has been the proliferation of the turf. It is. Uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the past, as a figure-oriented guy, uh, you know, handicapping dirt you know, a card of nine dirt races was relatively easy because with the figures, you, you can narrow, you know, at, a, at your first glance, narrow down the field. But when, when you've got, you know, 12 or 14 maidens on the turf, and uh, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a, you know, a huge difficult undertaking that, you know, to, uh, to untangle those races, at least for me. Well, I think one of the changes also just changes how you handicap because you do much more trip handicapping, yeah. and even to a certain extent, class and putting together because the figures don't work the same way they do in dirt racing. Yeah, and uh, uh, you know, it's, you know, the, the, the figures are were designed for dirt, and uh, you know, we, we've made adaptations to you know to to make them work on, on turf, but the, the trouble with turf. Is is the frequent slow paces uh, 
uh, when uh, you know all of our favorite jockeys decide they're uh, going to rate their speed horses today, you will some, sometimes have situations where the pace is just so slow that that horses can't accelerate enough to, to run a final time as fast as they would normally be capable, and so that kind of you know so so we have to wing it and uh, you know and, and making the figures and you know it's less precise. Well, I mean, a, a classic example of that is something happened this meet when, when Flintshire ran in the Bowling Green and, and deeply undervalued, who's another horse trained by Chad Brown, both raced for a mile and three eighths that day, and I think they went in almost exactly the same. Actually, the other horse raced, but much faster, deeply undervalued because of the ridiculous pace in the Flintshire race. Right, and, and when, when we're making figures and we see these crazy situations, you know, we're not going to give that, you know, that Indeed, ridiculous horse a higher figure than the, you know, the best figure. It's actually pretty good. Turf horse in America, but uh, uh, but then but people say, well, how could you do this? Uh, but you know, you, you just have to do, use a little more uh, superimposing of your judgment in turf races because if you take everything at face value, you're really going to get crushed. No, I agree, and, and it would it would just ruin the thing. So in talking about bets, one of, one of my favorite topics of conversation with you in multi race bets is jackpot bets, and jackpot bets have become very prevalent, particularly with the rain. Go six down in Florida, and it's a bet that I personally am against. And I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on jackpot wagers. You know, I, I, I think it was a really evil, a cynical innovation uh, <laughs> that uh, I, know, I blame the, you know, the Stronic group for doing it the Gulfstream, and it is you know sort of you know spread like a, a disease or you know around the whole. <laughs> Let me just say, if you're not aware of jackpot bets, they're bets where a significant portion of the pool is carried over every day unless there's one single winner. So it ends up that people playing it, there's a huge takeout on their bet that day, and these big pots build up because as time goes by, it's very hard for one single person to have it, and then they eventually give all the money away at the end of the term. Right. And these were billed as a bet for the little guy because the unit was, uh, say, and golf stream was 10 cents or about 20 cents at golf stream. And so, uh, you know, the average player with a small bankroll could, could take a shot at these big payoffs. But, but the little guy had no chance because these bets attract huge players who have, you know, the staying power and the bankroll size to blanket, uh, you, know, every, you, know, you know, every conceivable combination. Uh, uh, and, and you couldn't, you know, if you were just a, a normal handicapper, you couldn't possibly have a ticket that, that these guys beat. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it would, you know, uh, uh, the, the ultimate example came uh, when uh, Gulfstream had this jackpot running into the millions, and a super rich guy from Philadelphia named Dan Borislaw, uh, you know, played like all, 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 all in four races and put in a bet, you know, in, in six figures and got some absolutely crazy results, and uh, you know, and and, and won them in six million, a six, six and million died a month later. Uh, sure. you know, and the money is now out of circulation. Your money, all the people who play. And, and so, it, and it's taken away from uh, from uh, from Jack from carryover normal carryover pools. I mean, I would I would always look at the you know at the the listing of carryovers and say, oh gee, you know, there's a ten thousand in the pay for the sin of boy of dams maybe I'll handicap this. Uh, Nobody I don't know if any of you were familiar, they had a, a, one of these jackpot bets going for four weeks on quarter horse racing at Portland Meadows this winter. Um, they had a rainbow six. Nobody loved that bet more than Andy Byer. Well actually it was third breads going two furlongs. <laughs> I can make for my own use some two fur long uh, uh, Oregon figures. And, uh, it was, it was We're Joe fun. Stone grabs and Andy's looking at his phone and going, it's got like a $30 horse on the second leg. Portland Meadows, big six. 
uh, you've completely done that. And I, I, the problem with the, with the Rainbow Six also is that it, it builds up on the money of the people in this room, and it sets it up for big, big betters to take the money. And I just think that's sort of patently unfair. I believe that, listen, big betters can bet their money, but it'd be nice like the pick five, and we're introducing a late pick five, when Ira Betts late pick five for the last four days of this meet. The pick five is a bet, it's a 50% takeout, and it's us playing against each other, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah, and the, uh, the, the, low, the low takeout pick five has been one of the better innovations that's come along in some time, because the, you know, the 50 cent unit is reasonable, you can still get giant payoffs, and, uh, and you don't have uh, you know, a type of bet where, where, the, where these syndicates and monster players are just just because they've got bigger bankrolls have like an inherent huge advantage over everybody else. I agree. Now let's talk about specific horses. I want to hear your opinion on Arrogate, the horse who uh, put in the most impressive performance that I think a lot of us have seen in years and won the Travers last week. It was, it was a, a terrific effort, not totally out of the blue. I mean, in his second career start this year, he ran a uh, figure of 103, which was the equal of any three-year-old in, in, in the country, you know, as good as uh, of all the big name horses of the Kentucky Derby. But uh, nobody, I mean, for, to, to, to explode and run a 122, I mean, that was, that was pretty shocking. I think one, one reason it happened, obviously this was a good horse, but he, he uh, Arrogate is in the hands of uh, you know, one of the few remaining trainers who still loves speed. And Baffert, Baffert is not shy about you know, using horses' speed and just going to the front, uh, you know, as opposed to so many members of this profession who kind of instinctively say, oh, let's take them back a little and get them covered up or more, you know, that, that nonsense. And so they, you know, they just let him roll. And, uh, you know, and when good horses can, can you know, have the talent to do that, you know, let them run from the gate. You know, they, you know, they can do, uh, you know, they're, they're given the chance to do a, a blockbuster performance like that. And I thought it was particularly interesting coming a week after Songbird. And Songbird is a wonderful racehorse, and her performances in Saratoga were terrific. But it irks me a little that she was being anointed as a great horse. And I, I have trouble with the word great, because I think that we need to reserve it for the true great. So when you say it, I, I think Arrogate's performance was a great performance. He's not a great horse yet, but it was a great performance. And I think it was a good reminder for racing fans of what greatness looks yeah, like. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean we're, we're very much alike. That when, when, when people uh, try to get on a bandwagon and over, over hype horses and look at a good horse and say, this is one of the all-time greats, it's just annoying if you have some perspective. And, and in the case of Songbird, she ran her last quarter mile in, in 27 seconds. Seconds. If there had been a you know a, a decent closing uh, filly in, in the field, uh, she she would have lost. And uh, uh, so it, it wasn't it wasn't that great. It was you know, it was a good effort. But, she, uh, she was the best horse in the race and earned it. But to, by comparison, Arrogate, after going a much faster pace, he came home at 23 and four fifths. So it's a it's a big difference. And I mean we've been blessed to see some very good performances is the meat, different kinds of horses in different situations, but Arrogate was the real deal. The, the, you know, I, I, I went back through the, uh, the, the record books and the, pre, the, the, the prehistoric fire figures. Uh, and I love the prehistoric yeah. <laughs> well, Before they were published, and uh, you know, the, maybe the greatest race ever run in Saratoga was General Assembly's uh, Travelers. Would be won by 15, and that that would, on today's scale, would probably would have been a figure over 130. But since 1979, that year, nobody had run a race like that in the track. It was a, a truly remarkable performance, and uh, so you're up in Saratoga. You're ready. Gabby's going to be on Talking Horses with me Saturday. I'm going to be meaner to him than I am to Gabby. <laughs> I've got one horse that I kick just so you can heap abuse on me. I'm not going to give you any toys. If you, you will, 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 you
you will be right me so badly, and you'll probably be right. But uh, you know, the stage is set. We'll see what happens. I mean, I uh, after my bike ride this morning, I started handicapping one, and I still haven't finished the car. <laughs> and I, I, I knowing how how hard these cards are. I mean, I this is this is why I now stand in awe of you because to do the kind of work that you have to do to, to, to get up publicly and, and, and be intelligent about, you know, That's not 12, you know, well, 12, you know, 12 races a day for 40 days, it's exhausting. Well, thank you. I, you know, I like handicapping. The best part of my job is handicapping. The rest of it's my job. But the handicapping part, that's pretty fun. I mean, taking apart races and trying to figure out who's going to win them. But I wouldn't have been able to do it if it wasn't for you. If I hadn't put picking winners when I was a kid, and I think I, I'm like a lot of people, picking winners changed my life. It was the greatest thing that happened to me in my life. Well, I have a lot of lost silver, so I'm not going to do it. Andy Byer, I want to thank you so much for joining us. See you later. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Have a great day.